live. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Weiss. I am the Federal Treasurer of Socialist Action, a steering committee member of the NDP Socialist Caucus, past secretary of the Toronto and York Region Labour Council, and a retired member of the Canadian Union of Postal Workers. We acknowledge that we are hosting this event on Indigenous lands, including the unceded territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Wendat, and Audenoshani people. We join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assets of the big resource corporations and returning them to the commons. Tonight's webcast is titled Rosa Luxemburg and the Revolutionary Party, with Stephen Ellis, veteran socialist, plus discussant Dele El Cadra, John Riddell, author of several books on the Communist International in the 1920s. Dalia El Cadra will lead off the discussion with an introduction to the life of Rosa Luxemburg. Then Stephen Ellis will speak for about 20 minutes, followed by John Riddell, who will speak for about 10 minutes. Then we will take a few questions from the online audience. Audience members can submit a question anytime by accessing the webcast directly from YouTube and by typing the question directly into the chat column. Please direct your questions if you wish to a specific panelist or to everyone. If you like this webcast, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. If you agree with what you hear during this program, join Socialist Action by signing up at our website, www.socialistaction.ca, and by calling 647-986-1917. That's 647-986-1917. So let's begin. Dalia El Kadra was born in the Middle East. She is a leading member of the Oakville Palestinian Rights Association and the Coalition Against Israeli Apartheid. Welcome, Dalia. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, let's begin with talking about uh, Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, Rosa was born to a liberal father and a religious mother in uh, Poland. And uh, she has an exciting life. She was very highly educated woman compared to that age. She has had her doctoral degree in, uh, within the law. A number of her ideas focused on the working class and obtaining the freedom of speech. And uh, she has from a number of local newspapers plus her membership with the SPD. Uh, Rosa believed in regards of the freedom of speech that uh, it is for everyone. It doesn't include people who are in the same party, which is an idea that most uh, parties still now still dispute and still argue. Because you, as you would see, for example, that most ideas that, uh, for example, uh, focus on the freedom of speech is basically if you're in the same party. But if you have a different point of view, then it doesn't include you to that point. Uh, she rejected the, the war and she had continued at that time and she has planned for anti-war demonstrations. She believed that revolution is the way and eventually that would get, get her to a number of uh, conflicts with her party, which eventually led to her execution. Uh, she believed in the class struggle. She believed in class uh, consciousness. She believed in, she opposed, as, as we said, sending the working class to a war which national bourgeois basically would finance and uh, control the world resources and markets. Uh, as I would have seen and read about her life in general, that she believed in the struggle. She believed in certain ideas that she developed since her uh, young age. And she maintained that struggle. She maintained that conflict. She maintained those ideas. And I think that is something impressive, not to be tempted with what happened with like several people of the SPD party at that time, where they were tempted to a certain more different uh, economical class, as we say. But she maintained the struggle. She maintained her opinions at that time. Uh, so I think in general, I think that was 
maybe a short introduction for what Tour de Luxembourg was about, but I think that her ideas were interesting in those aspects. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dalia. Thank you. The, ne the next speaker is Stephen Ellis, a civil liberties, a liberties lawyer, a Palestine solidarity activist, and a longtime leader and educator on the socialist left in Canada. Welcome, Stephen. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Every tradition has its heroes. One of mine is Rosa Luxemburg. She was a courageous fighter. Her intellectual gifts were on par with Marx and Engels. She was a committed internationalist. She was a woman in a scene dominated by men. She struggled all her life with a physical disability. And she was a Jew in an environment where anti-Semitism was rife. She was the best of what humanity had to offer and her legacy clearly lives on. On January the 12th, 2003, over 100,000 people attended a rally in Berlin to commemorate her life and that of Karl Liebknecht. Rosa Luxemburg is without doubt a giant in the revolutionary tradition. She made invaluable contributions to our understanding of the dangers of reformism, militarism, and imperialism. Her life and work also speak to the search for a liberating alternative to the globalization of capital. More than any other Marxist of her generation, Luxembourg theorized capitalism's incessant drive for self-expansion. She also underlined the importance of the mass strike and socialist democracy. Today, I wanna to talk about her views on the Socialist Party. The context will be the explosion of the First World War and the German Revolution of 1918-1919. I will leave out for the sake of convenience the March action of 1921 and the failure of the German October of 1923 for another time. Others might want to take up this discussion. I would nonetheless argue that these events provide important lessons for socialists. I would also point out that we have an expert on the topic as a discussant on this web talk, John Riddell, as editor of several books on the topic of the Communist International. So any questions I can answer can perhaps be posed to him. So let's start with August the 4th, 1914. This was the date when the most important socialist party in the world, the German Social Democratic Party or SPD, voted for war. The SPD was considered the model of a socialist party with more than a million members and over 90 daily papers. Luxembourg was a member of the SPD. It's hard to overstate the betrayal this represented for socialists. It was said that Luxembourg was so crushed by the news that the SPD had voted for war credits that she contemplated suicide. When Lenin himself first got the news, he assumed it was a forgery by the German authorities. But it was real. The international lined up behind the murderous ruling classes who sent a generation to their death in the battlefields of Europe. Luxembourg described the terrible human cost thus, the flower of our youthful strength, hundreds of thousands are rotting upon the battlefields. The fruit of the sacrifices and toil of generations is destroyed in a few short weeks. The choicest troops of the international proletariat are torn out by the life roots. The left now paid the price for their underestimation of the power of the SPD right wing. Having never organized a national faction to fight, the revolutionaries pulled together a loose grouping under the banner of the Spartacus League, named after the leader of the slave revolt in ancient Rome. In 1915, Luxembourg wrote the Junius pamphlet, which called for strikes to end the war and laid the blame for the war squarely on the German authorities. By the middle of 1916, it became obvious that the SPD was headed for a split. On the right, SPD leaders like Nosk and Scheidemann wholeheartedly supported the war and enforced a no-strike pledge on the unions. By 1915, they were opening, openly endorsing the German government's plans to annex foreign territory and create a German empire. 
On the left, the Spartacus League champion mass strikes and mutinies to bring the war to an end. In between these groups, centrist leaders like Kotsky and Bernstein opposed mass action, but favored negotiations to end the war. The pending split posed a serious question for the left. Should they launch a clearly revolutionary party or should they join with the centrists in a new party in which revolutionaries would remain a minority? Karl Radek, a Polish communist working closely with Lenin, strongly advocated for the left to found a revolutionary party based on the Bolshevik policy of turning the world war into a civil war between capitalism and socialism in each belligerent nation. Yet most leaders of the left still refused to fully break with the center. Indeed, this became an important source of conflict at the socialist anti-war conferences at Zimmerwald and Keenthal in 1915 and 1916. There, Lenin failed to convince the German left to turn their back on the center and speak out for creating a new revolutionary international. Luxembourg and Liebknecht still feared that they would become isolated and lose any connection with the working class movement if they set off on their own. Spartacus League's refusal to prepare for the split in an organized way only passed the initiative to the SPT right leadership, which immediately moved to expel them all. Two months later, the independent SPD or the USPD with some 120,000 members was formed, uniting the left and the center, while the SPD right kept 170,000 members. In Russia, the 1917 February Revolution overthrew the Tsar and raised the confidence of the working class and the left in Germany. The Bolshevik Revolution in October ended the war with Germany and convinced millions of workers that socialist revolution was on the order of the day. 1918 was a year of devastating economic hardship for German workers and a catastrophic killing of soldiers. The USPD grew by leaps and bounds at the expense of the SPD and the left wing became radicalized under the impact of the Bolshevik Revolution. The idea of a Russian type revolution based on workers' councils became very popular among millions of workers and soldiers. In November 1918, sailors mutinied in Kiel and set into motion a rebellion in the army. Workers launched a general strike quickly leading to the overthrow of the Kaiser, the collapse of the German government, and the proclamation of the German Republic. Workers' councils were formed in dozens of cities in imitation of the Russian Soviets. The Spartacus League's leaders felt vindicated by the rush of events. The November Revolution unleashed a blur of events that would have challenged the strongest of revolutionary parties. With the army in rebellion, the conservative parties agreed to hand power over to a coalition of six SPD and USPD ministers in a calculated attempt to pacify the masses. SPD right leader Ebert, thanks to the revolutionary action of the working class that he had so long opposed, now became the chancellor. Meanwhile, a sharp debate broke out within the USPD right of the party favored throwing its weight behind the government and pushing for new elections to the Reichstag. Luxembourg spoke in favor of building up the power of workers' councils as a dual power, aiming to eventually uh, replace the Reichstag and the capitalist state bureaucracy with a Russian-type system based directly on workers' councils alone. A vote of 485 to 185 at a mid-December conference in favor of the rights perspective showed that with the war ending, the majority of USPD leadership were opposed to a renewed wave of workers' struggle to usher in socialism. Thus, the USPD splintered at the very moment when it was most important to pose an alternative to the SPD, leaving the revolutionaries without a party. During the years 1914 to 1918, the League's leaders never fully clarified the purpose of their work among themselves. I'm talking about the Spartacus League. Was it to prepare for the founding of a separate revolutionary party or simply to try to push the USPD to the left? At each crucial stage, they were left wondering who was with them and who was against them. Rather than setting the pace, they could only react to events. In August 1914, 
and again in November 1918. The USPD majority decision to turn away from the workers' councils finally forced the Spartacus leaders to found their own party, but not until after the first phase of the revolution was coming to a close. By way of comparison, in January 1917, the Bolsheviks had roughly 25,000 members with a 15-year tradition of common party activity. The experiences of 1905 under their belts and an impressive underground and legal press that was distributed to tens of thousands of workers. The Spartacus League had a few hundred members, did not have its own regular publication, and possessed very little experience of organized common struggle against the other factions and parties. Despite their woefully late start, by the end of November 1918, the prospects for founding a revolutionary party appeared good to the Spartacus leaders. But the forces that the founding Congress of the KPD attracted were very small. In Berlin on December the 30th, 1918, just 112 delegates met, representing several thousand members and tens of thousands who actively sympathized with the new party. Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht, Paul Levy, Clara Zetkin, and almost all of the best known Spartacus leaders argued to take part in the elections on the grounds that the SPD and the USPD had already successfully disbanded the workers' councils and that the left was not strong enough to create a new revolution by itself. Therefore, the KPD should use the election campaign to popularize its ideas and recruit new members, as the Bolsheviks had done after the 1905 revolution. Yet the overwhelming majority of the KPD delegates were very hostile to this position because they expect a new spontaneous revolution to break out at any moment. They voted 62 to 23 against participation in the elections. Worse, the KPD voted that trade unions were outdated and that revolutionaries should work to convince workers to quit them in favor of workers' councils. These ultra-left positions led to the collapse of negotiations with the revolutionary shop stewards. At the time, Luxembourg believed that the KPD's ultra-leftism was simply the squalls of an infant. She believed that the spontaneous struggles of the working class would correct the KPD's errors in practice. The new KPD entered the volatile January 1919 situation with the strength to call some important protests but the KPD had no substantial organized base with only around 3,000 members who had any notion of acting as an organized party. Compared to the national apparatus and mass membership of both the SPD and USPD, the KPD was virtually powerless. Its forces were so meager that they struggled simply to communicate between cities and even between sections of Berlin. While Lenin hailed the party's founding, it was a party that could not yet coordinate events regionally or nationally. But that realization would come only after another terrible blow. In response to a deliberate provocation by the ST, SDP, SPD Berlin authorities in January, Liebknecht and the revolutionary shop stewards launched a general strike and called for the overthrow of the government. Although the strike was initially met with enthusiasm, it was poorly organized and the SPD government was able to mount a counteroffensive. The January strike was like the situation the Bolsheviks faced in July of 1917. Then the mass of Petrograd workers and soldiers launched semi-organized, semi-spontaneous strikes and armed demonstrations. Lenin opposed the mobilizations because he believed that even if they could take power in Petrograd, the rest of the country was not yet as politically radical and they would quickly be isolated. The Bolsheviks called the July days more than a strike, but less than an insurrection. Even though they disagreed with the protests, they sent their tens of thousands of members into Petrograd, into the streets with the workers and soldiers in order to do their best to prevent chaos. The Bolsheviks were able to prevent a premature uprising and help the masses make a relatively orderly and organized retreat when the right wing counterattacked. 
faced with similar grassroots uh, outburst uh, of anger and disillusionment on the part of the Berlin working class and soldiers, the KPD proved utterly incapable of employing the tactics the Bolsheviks used in the July days. The party's forces were so feeble that Luxembourg was not even aware of what her closest collaborator, Liebknecht, was doing. In the first phase of the German Revolution, proved that the KPD was not yet up to the task. It also proved that the reformist leaders in the SPD turned out to be the most ruthless practitioners of counter-revolutionary cunning and violence. Faced with the collapse of the regular army, the German ruling class financed a paramilitary force of thousands of right-wing army officials, the Freikorps. While this force was small, it was disciplined, well-armed, and committed to its goal of suppressing workers and smashing the revolutionary left. The SPD ministers, especially Gustav Noska, helped bring this force into being, defended it, and deployed it to restore order throughout Germany in the months after November 1918 did not flinch from murder, even if it meant the murder of former comrades. Liebknecht and Luxembourg were captured, tortured, and shot without trial. SPD Minister Scheidemann justified the murders, laying blame on the victims while absolving his own government of any responsibility. The January strike and the wave of repression that followed drove the KPD underground and set the revolution back. Radek was arrested but not killed. In his memoirs, Noska admitted that 1,200 were massacred, but revolutionaries claimed the number was more like 3,000. The leadership of the Communist Party had not been able to prevent the crushing of the movement which it had helped to unleash. Despite their losses, the KPD and the revolutionary vanguard of the working class were not finished they spent the next four and a half years waging a bitter struggle to resolve the riddles left unanswered by the martyrs of 1919. How do we understand what happened? Despite their hostility to the growing bureaucracy within the SPD and USPD and the drift to the right, Luxembourg and her co-thinkers never sought to systematically organize themselves as a coherent group to fight for leadership of these parties. The theoretical basis of their passive attitude to the question of organization lay mostly, most clearly in Luxembourg's understanding of the relationship between the Socialist Party and the working class. She believed that the party bureaucracy was conservative and that it was an outgrowth of the excessive centralization or centralism of power in the hands of the full-time party apparatus. She argued that while the left should oppose this tendency towards bureaucracy, the spontaneous struggle of the working class would be the key factor in overcoming the bureaucracy's conservatism at the decisive moment. Luxembourg also consistently opposed Lenin's method of building up an organized group of revolutionaries with its own press and system of communication, which aimed to carry its positions into every party branch and every group of workers possible. She rejected a sectarian, Lenin's practice of constructing a faction that had the common experience of working together over the course of years and submitting to a commonly agreed upon discipline. As she put it to a friend, we cannot be outside the organization, out of contact with the masses. The worst of workers' parties is better than nothing. But Lenin's method proved much more practical than Luxembourg's. The Bolsheviks had a principled organization of revolutionaries with a critical mass, rooted in key workplaces that had spoken out strongly against the war. Luxembourg was censored by the right of her own party and was not permitted to publish anything with no independent organization or publication of her own. Rosa Luxembourg was a product of an age of change and instability when socialism was central to a mass labor movement and worldwide socialist revolution was a concrete possibility. Her premature death also marks a turning point in history. Yet, an alternative reality was indeed possible. The socialist revolution could have succeeded in Germany, rescued Soviet Russia, and spread across the globe. And the 20th century could conceivably 
have been spared Stalinism, fascism, and World War II. The balance sheet provides many important lessons for revolutionaries today. First, the First World War confirmed that political ideas matter. Indeed, they can lead people to different sides of the barricades. The debate between Bernstein and Luxembourg had real life consequences, even if it was not completely obvious at the time. Kotsky's attempt to paper over these fights merely served to disorient the left and gain time for the right to consolidate its control of the party apparatus. Second, the capitalists are ingenious when it comes to patching up their system and passing on the cost of the crisis to workers. Yet the ruthless economic competition that lies at the heart of the capitalist system forces the capitalists and the governments they control to confront one another in the hopes that they will be the last man standing, even if it threatens their common ruin. Kotsky could not believe European capitalism would plunge itself into full-scale war. In fact, it did so twice between 1914 and 1945. Capitalism breeds war, and that danger will only pass when it is replaced with socialism. Finally, Luxembourg was a political giant, yet lacking a powerful political party with clear Marxist ideas based in the working class, she could not put her revolutionary principles into practice. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. The next speaker is John Riddell, the author of several books on the Communist International in the 1920s, a longtime activist, and today devotes much energy to solidarity with Palestine. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. It's so wonderful to, to be with all you comrades and friends tonight. And so I'd like to approach the questions raised by Steve from a somewhat different point of view. And my vantage point actually is to go back almost 60 years to when I became a socialist at the beginning of the 1960s. Now, when I was, uh, when I became a socialist, there was no published collection of Rosa Luxemburg's writings. But in 1961, the authorities in East Germany published a volume of her works. Now, as it happened, I went to Germany in 1961. So I made a point of going to a left-wing bookstore. It was run, I remember, by Axel Gudes in Hamburg. And I picked up a copy. To my dismay, the first 150 pages consisted of a shrill denunciation of Rosa Luxemburg based on criticisms raised in 1931 by uh, Joseph Stalin. Now, a little background here. Uh, what does Stalin have to do with it? Now, in East Germany at that time, you had the German Democratic Republic, which claimed to be socialist, but which is in fact was run in a bureaucratic spirit and along the lines of the rule of Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union. Uh, and so it would be natural for them in anything they said about Luxembourg to pick up the criticisms of Stalin. Now, what did Stalin hold against Luxembourg? It's interesting that this discussion, which I came to completely independently of Stephen, happens to converge with his central point. What Stalin held against Luxembourg was that Stalin said that Luxembourg had supported the German Marxist leader, Karl Kautsky, the major leader of the International Socialist Movement until 1914, while Lenin had steered towards a split with Kautsky during that time. Well, in fact, actually the opposite was true. It was Rosa Luxemburg that had moved towards building a left against Kautsky in Germany, while Lenin did not move in that direction. And uh, to the end of his life, continued to refer to Kautsky as a Marxist up until 1914. Now, Kaut Lenin even wrote a well-known letter in 1914 acknowledging that Luxembourg had been right to oppose Kautsky before the war at a time when Lenin himself did not do so. As far as I know, that's as far as Lenin ever went. I do not know that he ever 
uh, made a self-criticism of uh, his conduct towards Kautsky before the war. He made a very eloquent uh, statement about Kautsky when he was a Marxist, meaning up to 1914, as late as 1920. Now, during Lenin's lifetimes, differing views on this and other historical questions were voiced in the Soviet press and the Communist International. You can find in books that I publish uh, statements by uh, communist leaders in the international on one side and on the other side of the question that has been posed tonight. And that was considered as uh, natural that uh, when we look at history, we have different interpretations. But the Stalinist party that emerged uh, in the late 1920s had an official view of Marxist history and open inquiry had been essentially shut down. I believe there's a lesson here for Marxist groups today. Debate history to be sure, but don't vote on history and don't build an interpretation of history into your party's basic line. But why do you did Lenin, why did Stalin care so much about Luxembourg so many years after she was killed? I think the answer doesn't have much to do with attitudes towards Karl Kautsky. To find the act answer, let's look at the activities of Rosa Luxemburg's closest colleagues and co-workers after she died on their activities through the 1920s. It was a brilliant team, including, I'm going to mention some unfamiliar names here, Clara Zetkin, above all, also Paul Levy, Edwin Hörnle, August Thalheimer, Heinrich Brandler, Ernst Meyer, all in Germany, and in Poland, Leo Josef, Julian Machlewski, Vera Krasterze, Adolf Bashovsky, and others. When Stalin wrote his attack on Luxembourg, all these figures were in opposition to Stalin. Their main disagreement concerned the United Front, which Stalin, when he wrote this article in 1931, now opposed, while Luxembourg's colleagues all defended United Front politics. In fact, in my opinion, they have a good claim to be its originators. For more on this question, see on my blog, which is called johnriddell.com, an article called Zetkin's Defense of the United Front. And if you can remember Z-E-T-K-I-N, you'll find your way to it. Actually, the United Front question had not been posed in Luxembourg's lifetime. She had no position on it. But Luxembourg had a strong orientation towards working class unity in action, expressed in her writings on mass strikes. I believe Luxembourg's friends and colleagues were right in believing that the United Front flowed logically from her thinking. Now, I think I have a couple of minutes left, and I, so I say something about the questions that Steve, Steve raised, which are obviously closely related to the ones that I've been discussing and that Stalin was discussing. You know, Rosa Luxemburg was, was the main leader of a revolutionary socialist party in Poland. And it became a stalwart uh, component of the Communist International after 1918-1919. So I think that when we, we, it, it's, it's a little over hasty to characterize Luxembourg's approach towards politics in terms of what she did in the Social Democratic Party of Germany, you have to consider there's also this other example and her thought and obviously embraced both cases. And I think that if her spirit was able to speak to us tonight, she would say, well, the circumstances were different. Now, I noticed another thing about the group around Luxembourg in Germany. Now, this may sound a little apolitical, but they were mostly Jews and they were mostly from Poland. And to be a Polish Jew in Germany at that time was sort of like less than nothing. 
they were subject to a severe racist prejudice. I don't think it was possible to build a revolutionary current in the German working class at that time it was, that was, had that you know, demographic limitation. So I think that's a suggestion that she had some objective um, problems that she was dealing with. Who were her close allies in Germany apart from this core? Well, there was um, there was Karl Liebknecht, but he wasn't an ally. Actually, he was with Kautsky during that period. But he only came to Luxembourg's positions during the war. So I'm not going to go further into this because I think that there's a lot to it and it's worth another evening of discussion. But I think we should be careful about putting too much weight of responsibility on Rosa Luxemburg's shoulders. One question is to consider here is, what about the politics of the working class itself? You know, we sometimes talk as if the politics of the working class are determined by the attitudes of the leaders, but the working class has its own autonomous thinking, or perhaps lines of thought. And in fact, the loyalty to the social democratic movement proved to be very strong in the German working class to the extent that in the end, a mass party of about 400,000 members, which thought of itself as social democratic, joined the communist international. It's just the timing was off. But there's another thing. During the, war, during the period of the First World War, the workers who were in motion during that period and who came to revolutionary positions were generally very, very strongly ultra left in their thinking. Uh, that was not Rosa Luxemburg's fault. You have, to, you have to recognize that workers think as they do because of things in their experience and their context, which can't simply be determined from outside. And that was a major, major problem. For example, the, what uh, Stephen mentioned that the uh, the shop stewards movement in Berlin, those were the forces that actually carried out the uh, anti uh, the, the revolution in Germany against the old empire. They came to the Communist Party and entered into discussions, but they were completely repelled by the comrades of the Communist Party their ultra position, ultra left positions on a whole series of questions, including, for example, that they didn't want to work in the unions. Well, the shop stewards, they came from the unions. They came from the factories. So it was a big objective problem. And it took a while to work that one through. But in the meantime, the revolution had been lost. So I'm not going to I'm not going to go further than that. I'm going to just encourage you all to uh, think more and uh, read more on this question. Uh, there's a, a number of articles on Rosen Luxemburg on my blog, actually. Uh, so I just invite you to uh, ask some questions and, uh, and raise some ideas and let's take it from there. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, John. And thank you all. So now with the help of our technical producer, Kurt Young, we'll air some questions from our online audience. And as Kurt has told the panelists earlier, he will put the questions in the chat column, or if those can't see that, then maybe you can write them down. And each, um, we're going to take three questions and we will go back to the panelists and they have up to six minutes each to answer one or all three questions. And the lineup to speak will be, Stephen will be first, then John, and then Dahlia. So Kurt, go ahead. Okay, so I'd like to start with a message from our uh, host and uh, uh, chairwoman. She says, thank you, Stephen, for your presentation on Rosa. It was great to hear some of her story again. My two heroes in history for similar but different reasons are Rosa Luxemburg and James Connolly. So our first question comes from uh, Roy Jones. He says, hi comrades. How have the capitalists changed their behavior, actions, policies due to Rosa Luxemburg? We have another quest, uh, question from Betty Jane 
and uh, and vicious viscous. Please explain the difference between spontaneity and Leninism and why one is preferred over the other. Um, and our last question for uh, for this round comes from Daniel Terade, and he asks. I have been frustrated by my local student union, which openly questioned the tactical benefits of striking. How can the lessons of Rosa Luxemburg be used to argue for militancy in our unions? Okay, you've seen or heard the questions. So we will start with Steve, Stephen, and you have up to six minutes, comrade. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Sometimes the... Um, the, the question is posed in this way, and that is uh, Rosa Luxemburg represented a spontaneous uh, perspective on revolutionary uh, politics, and that is sometimes counterposed with Leninism, which uh, apparently has more of an emphasis on organization. Um, I think that's putting it really too, too black and white. Um, when, when you read uh, what Rosa was writing about spontaneity, what she was putting forth was the notion that not that uh, political parties are not important. The Revolutionary Socialist Party uh, was as vital to um, Rosa Luxemburg as it was to Lenin. But Rosa was dealing with a very different situation in Germany uh, than Lenin uh, had to deal with in Russia. In Russia, of course, um, they were uh, working underground. Uh, it was a police state, very, very hard to organize. And so the emphasis uh, for many uh, in Lenin's organization, the Bolsheviks, was organization. Organization was so key. And involvement of the membership in making the... Uh, making the party uh, democratic and accountable to its membership was, uh, was, was, was vital. For Rosa, the context was different. It was uh, in Germany, uh, the second largest industrial uh, nation in the world. They were working in a, in a context of legality. Um, the SPD had, uh, for, for a number of uh, decades, had uh, worked uh, openly and notoriously as a socialist party. And what she was uh, criticizing in terms of the, uh, the centrists within the SPD was, was its bureaucratic nature, was uh, individuals like Bernstein who was arguing that, you know, uh, maybe the kinks had been worked out of capitalism and that maybe we don't need to build um, build and, and argue for a revolution to finally deal with capitalism. So both Rosa and Lenin were dealing with two very different phenomena. And for Rosa, the bureaucracy, the conservative bureaucracy uh, at the head, at the very top of the SPD was, was the matter that, that workers had to deal with conclusively. And for her, only the spawn the spontaneity of, of the masses, of the workers had the power to sweep away that bureaucratic caste on the top of the movement. Um, so uh, in my perspective, it seems that the different contexts that these two revolutionaries lived in determined how they, how they viewed the most immediate tasks facing them. So they weren't, uh, one side wasn't spontaneous and the other, uh, Leninist as such, um, but both dealing with very specific questions to arrive at a very similar uh, outcome. Okay, John. Okay, John, are you muted? Okay. Okay, very good. 
So how should we approach Daniel's question about uh, militancy in Rosa Luxemburg's time and ours? Well, it was not possible for her to be an uh, activist directly in the trade unions, and she had to act with appropriate deference towards those who were. The main question that she raised was the example of the mass strikes that had created the tumultuous Russian Revolution in 1905. She did that very vigorously, and there are substantial writings on that that uh, you can consult. Uh, I think you find a good representation on uh, Marxist internet archives. But then we also have the record of what the uh, organized workers achieved during the run-up to the revolution in Germany in, 19, in 1918. That is, that during the period of the war, under very, very severe um, uh, uh, repression uh, and, the, and the disruption of the workforce by the effect of the war itself, they were able to achieve a series of cumulatively growing general strike waves in Berlin and the other major cities that really, in a sense, grew over into the revolution itself, uh, which, uh, you know, with all due regard to the difference in context today, uh, showed how closely linked the union movement is to broader, um, uh, you know, to, to broader revolutionary developments in the society. Now, how did the capitalists, were, how did they respond to Rosa Luxemburg? That was the first question. Well, first, they prosecuted her repeatedly and very brutally, and she spent most of the war in jail. And second, when the revolution took place uh, and the capitalists started to uh, to reorganize and reassert their power. The way they did it was by forming fascist gangs. And these gangs uh, were actually like battalions of volunteers. And they were armed with modern military weapons and they were commanded by fascist minded uh, uh, officers and generals. And the uh, capitalists sent them into war against the workers' movement. And part of that war was to kill Rosa Luxemburg. That did not happen as an accident. That was an organized part of the war against the working class. And so I think that's the definitive thing to say about uh, the uh, capitalist attitude to Rosa Luxemburg. When I was in Germany in 1961, by the way, the guy who actually killed Rosa Luxemburg came to the surface and became a public figure for a while. And there was a great discussion of this. Was there anything wrong about what he did to Rosa Luxemburg? And the verdict of capitalist public opinion at that time was, well, not really, you know, these things happen. So much for the capitalist attitude to Rosa Luxemburg. Now, I think I've probably run through my time, so there's more in, uh, in what Stephen said that would be interesting to address, but uh, he covered the ground very well. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, can I please uh, divert this uh, the answer to Stephen or to uh, John? This is because they have more expertise on this area. Sure, sure. Dave, if you uh, you can wait for the next round of questions, you might feel uh, you want to speak there, sister. No problems. No problem. Okay, so we're going to move on now to three more questions. We might be able to get three rounds in here. So we're going to move on to the next three questions, and you have uh, each up to five minutes to answer. And the lineup will be Dahlia, Stephen, and John. Okay, so Kurt, go ahead. Three questions, please. All right, first question is from Ellen Ramsey. What are the key lessons we may learn for the political movement today from Lo Rosa Luxemburg's struggles? The second uh, question we have is from Barry Wise Letter, who asks, despite Rosa's inclination towards spontaneous workers' action from below, she did help to found the KPD, which joined the Communist International, and supported the Russian Revolution. 
Do you agree that Rose's legacy is linked to the need for revolt working class party? Or sorry, for a revolutionary working class party. And then um our next question comes from um Brandon Bakus, who asks, regardless of if her view would be most efficient or not, what do you feel Rosa would think of Canada today and what do you suspect she may do to deal with the current conditions? Okay, you each have up to five minutes. So Daria, would you like to go now? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. So to answer the first questions about the three key main things that we learned from Rosa Luxemburg, uh, in my own humble opinion, I think, number one, we need to be organized. Uh, most of the revolutions, for example, or struggle movement around the world, uh, they need to be more organized. They need to be focused more. They need to have more awareness. And I think that's the number of things that current movement, they lack. Uh, the other thing is focus on the struggle itself, not to be diverted with different agendas, uh, have a main goal main objectives to lead the struggle itself and to have the consciousness and to be aware about what you're moving, what you're struggling against, rather than, than having different uh, or, or being scattered with different ideas. So I would, I would believe that those are three things that different struggle groups and movement need to focus on the current time. And thank you. Thank you, Dalia. Thank you very much. Okay. Um... Stephen. Okay. When I hear those questions, a number of things come to mind. And certainly her um, critique uh, of, of reformism in her book, Reform and Revolution, I think is um, very relevant for us who are um, have to deal with uh, the issue of social democratic parties um, in our country. There's the issue of, of bureaucratic, what, what Lenin would call uh, capitalist workers' parties like the NDP. We've seen over the last number of years how incredibly bureaucratic, how completely bought in they are to the neoliberal agenda. So I think what we, what we get from Rosa and her writings like Reform and Revolution is a clarity you know, everything goes back to first principles. It's all about socialism from below, building a, a, a mass working class, um, grassroots uh, revolution to overthrow capitalism. And she was able to see, and this was something that John brought up, uh, and I think it's worth looking into, and that is, I think she was able to see uh, the danger of centrism uh, perhaps uh, a, in a clearer way than even uh, someone like Lenin was, because uh, certainly 1914 and, 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 and the vote for war credits, I think really spun Lenin's head around. I don't think he, he had the clearest vision of who Kotsky was, but I think Rosa had his number all the way from at least 1910 and going forward. So the role of bureaucracy in our unions and in our workers' organizations, I think, would be absolutely vital. She also wrote an important book on called The Accumulation of Capital, which I have not gone through, and which I understand is a pretty meaty book. And from what I hear is, is uh, uh, you know, on par with anything that Marx or Engels had ever written. And she'd, she'd written about the dynamic of capitalism. She'd written about the nature of imperialism and uh, the dynamic uh, of capitalism when it runs out of markets. What happens? Um, so if anyone has had the, uh, the pleasure of going through her accumulation of capital, this would be a good time to, to bring it up because I certainly haven't read it. I've only read uh, summaries of it, but it looks incredibly interesting. And the last thing I'll say is that um, Certainly in Canada, we have the issue of, of national, national struggles, the struggle of the Quebecois, the struggle of the First Nations people for self-determination. And certainly the, the attitude towards national liberation struggles that um, Rosa had uh, adopted was different from that of, of the Bolsheviks, Lenin and the Bolsheviks. Um, Lenin, 
in the context of Tsarist Russia had supported uh, the nation's right to self-determination. But um, it seems to me from my writing that Rosa uh, had a, a, a different attitude towards national liberation struggles and perhaps tended to see the nationalism of the oppressed as a bit of a diversion um, for socialists. So if anyone has any clearer thoughts on that, um, by all means, bring up those questions. Okay, thank you, Stephen. John? Uh, well, first of all, in with regard to what Barry said about spontaneity, well, yes, we have to be very alert to the power of spontaneous upsurges in the class struggle. And the whole phenomenon around Black Lives Matter in the last uh, several months is an example. Of course, the spontaneous upsurges have a tendency to pose questions without answering them. Uh, and so that's where the question of program uh, comes in. Uh, now, we should remember, though, uh, if, if people who know one thing about uh, Rosa Luxemburg know that she's a spontaneous. But now, hold on, hold on. Her career was spent as a leader of two revolutionary parties, one which was in Poland and the other which was in Germany. And the party of Germany was universally regarded as a revolutionary party in that period, one with problems, but nonetheless. Uh, no one was calling for a split from it, not Lenin either. Uh, so it doesn't sound like spontaneism to me. So I'm not sure exactly what this is. And here I get back to what I said about Stalin. Let's not be too quick to condemn uh, Rosa Luxemburg on the basis of, uh, of, of simplified conceptions. Now, one big advantage we have now, we don't have the socialist action book table because we're not able to meet together in one room. And that's an enormous problem. I don't know what to do about that. But we do have the Marxist internet archives. And it's now possible to go and uh, dig out some well-known work by Rosa Luxemburg or by any other leading Marxist and read what they actually said. Uh, sometimes, by the way, the translation quality is uneven, but, uh, you know, good luck. But nonetheless, you'll get the, good, the general idea. And uh, that means we have an enormous library at our disposal. And I think it's very important that we try to get back to what they actually said, rather than deal with people's impressions of what they said. Now, for example, on Rosa Luxemburg, there are a number of books of her writings, which I think can be get through libraries. Rosa Luxemburg Speaks, I helped to do that about 40 years ago. This Rosa Luxemburg Reader is a recent collection, very, very good, I recommend it. Also, this is a reference made to what I've written about the Communist International. I think I'm getting up to around seven or 8,000 printed pages so far. Uh, I apologize for that, but that they taught, they published a lot, and so I have too. But this book, The German Revolution and the Debate on, the Soviet, uh, on Soviet Power, is actually a book about Rosa Luxemburg in many ways. And if you would like to have a look at it or access it, you can get in touch with me through my blog, johnredell.com. And I, I would encourage you to approach it this way. Um, in that way, you'll answer for yourself the question, what in these thoughts are valid for us today. Uh, for example, Rosa Luxemburg wrote a, a good deal, as I recall, on indigenous societies. Well, there's one for you. Maybe that's the lesson there, where we'll find lessons for the day. Um, I think on the question of uh, what does Rosa Luxemburg mean to us today, let me look at it this way. The period before 1914 is generally regarded by historians as a very fine time in Europe. The a, a sort of a golden era where things were going well, when for a whole period of time there were not any major wars. And then all of a sudden everything went to hell. And you had a, a world war, uh, a series of revolutions and convulsions and so on. And Rosa Luxemburg had the foresight to see that that's where it was headed and to set about the process of socialist education and organization with all her skill and, and, and efforts to do that. 
And I think it's in that spirit we should look at it. Now, of course, those years before 1914 were not so wonderful, in fact. It was not so wonderful for women. It was not so wonderful for poor people or for workers or for people who were not white. But the, uh, but there was a, a remarkable phenomenon of a growing disharmony and internal conflict within the imperial system of that time that then led to a very, very serious breakdown. And I think that we can't help but think when we look at our international reality today uh, that there are signs of that in the, society, the world society before us now. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, folks, we have time for three more questions, and uh, that will be the final round. And you will have up to six minutes each uh, to answer, if you wish. And the lineup will be John, Dahlia, and Stephen. So, Kurt, did you put the three questions up? Yeah, um, so we're going to start off with a question first time from our uh, Facebook live, uh, live chat. But uh, before I do ask this question, I just want to inform everybody that a uh, link to John Rydell's blog is in the chat as well as uh, in the description below the video. So I will uh, commence with a question from uh, Semakaya, who asks, Rosa is not just historical character, but a character over history. Whatever she said about peace against the war, about reform and revolutions and mass strike and mass action. So in my opinion, she is giving us key from history for today's war as well. Am I right? Our next question comes from uh, Barry Wise Letter, who says, Rosa came out of the Mass Workers Party, the SPD of Germany. Maybe she didn't come out of it early enough or was a sufficiently disciplined revolutionary faction, but isn't there a lesson in this for socialists in Canada today? Doesn't it point to the need to fight the workers' bureaucracy and the mainstream workers' organizations to lay the basis for a revolutionary break with reformism towards revolution? And then our final question, or... We have two questions from Betty Jane Antena this this God. sorry I'm butchering the name, but I'll just ask both your questions as one. She says the Occupy movement was spontaneous, uh, spontaneous, failed for lack of disciplined leadership. Question mark, yes, question mark. And then uh, the next her final question was, what was her meaning uh, Rosa Luxemburg? position on the national question. Okay, so you've heard or seen the questions and we will go to uh, John to start. You have up to six minutes, comrade. So Sema said that Rosa Luxemburg provides keys from history for our reality today. I couldn't say it better. So I think that for 3D not a question, but guidance. And thank you very much for that, Sam. Now, Barry Weisleder said that isn't the lesson here that Rosa Luxemburg should have started sooner? Uh, you know, in the Socialist International, to build a, a separate revolutionary movement, in the Socialist uh, International before 1914, there were some air there were two parties in particular where they did break away from the Socialist International and set up their own parties very early. One was in the Netherlands and the other was in Bulgaria. Well, this is a big question, of course, but I, my impression is that neither one of these turned out very well and that they both suffered from separating from the mainstream of the labor movement. And, the, uh, and from all the guidance that that provides about the real dynamics of the working class. It doesn't settle the question, but it is some evidence on the other side. Uh, 
Rosa Luxemburg was not inactive in the uh, internal struggles of the Socialist Democratic Party. She was very active in them. Uh, in fact, uh, it was her initiative in large measure, together with Lenin, that pushed through the anti-war position of the Socialist International. It was not honored in 1914, but even then the fact it was passed was a tremendous example to working people. Uh, I think it was in 1912, for the first time, there was a organized attempt uh, to have an organized tendency in the Social Democratic Party. Um, and it was an occasion in which she had an alliance with some viable forces in the Social Democratic Party. She was not as isolated as she usually was. And I feel, my understanding of that is it was remarkable for its lack of success. <laughs> Um, so, in any way, I think that this experience, it just, it, it just frustrates easy answers. You know, it's necessary to look at that a little bit more clearly. The so one problem about this is if you set up your own revolutionary organization, will you be cutting yourself off from the mainstream of the workers' movement? Now, I think Barry Weisletter can answer that question. Socialist action does not cut itself off from the mainstream, precisely the opposite. You know, that the decisively you know, widely known feature of the socialist action is the tenacity and the courage with which it carries the struggle right into the mainstream organizations. And in fact, right into the membership of the New Democratic Party. That, that sounds to me rather like what Rosa Luxemburg did actually. So, uh, so I think that uh, in, in that sense, I think socialist action provides a very interesting example. Now, Rosa Luxemburg's position on, on the national question, uh, generally speaking, was judged at that, you know, in the wake of the Russian Revolution as not being too helpful. That is that uh, Rosa Luxemburg the main issue that was raised was the question of self-determination, pretty much in the way it is in Canada. Are you in favor of the self-determination of the Quebecois people? That is, if they want to separate from Canada, they have that right and should be supported in their struggle to do so. And that's the decisive question for my generation of socialists in Canada. Uh, even the NDP leadership was forced to give some ground on that one. Uh, on that question was posed very, very sharply in the Russian uh, empire of the czars, which was, as Lenin said, a prison house of peoples, uh, and in which the Russian people were actually minority and the other peoples were all subjugated. And in that situation, the Bolsheviks had a position calling for self-determination of all the subject peoples. And Rosa Luxemburg's position was that that was not a useful uh, command. Uh, a test of this came when the Polish uh, capitalist republic invaded the Soviet uh, Republic in 1920. And the uh, Soviets initially were successful and their armies tried to press towards the, uh, the Polish border and into Poland. That was a time at which it was very, very important to stress the right of the Polish people to self-determination. It was not helpful that the comrades who were leading that push into Poland came from Rosa Luxemburg's tradition and did not much raise that concept. So uh, I think that, I think I'll stop there. So this is my, my sign off here. So yeah. thank you for the wonderful opportunity to, to participate in this discussion which has opened up many, many questions and uh, which I find very stimulating. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade John. Okay, Dalia. Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to comment in regards to the first questions about Rosa Luxemburg's concept of uh, the peace again in opposing to the war. And I think it is unfortunate that after 100 years of now, we're still discussing and debating the, the, the same matter. But I think it's the same conflict that we're still surviving at. You have the economical domination of countries who's looking to control other countries uh, to use their resources for whatever economical or political agenda. And therefore, 
peace cannot happen unless, for example, you concentrate on the same class consciousness and people are aware to what's going behind their back and to understand, for example, the political agenda, to understand the economic motivation, to, to, to understand, for example, why do you have till now to, to for example, send a youth, for example, uh, your youth uh, soldiers or uh, army to fight a war that's basically been planned by your bourgeois or by your capitalist so far. So peace cannot be peace cannot be completed or peace cannot be even the idea of discussing the peace itself cannot be initiated till you have a class conscience of what's going on and to have that class be organized and aware and looking behind the agenda itself. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, sister, thank you. Okay, our last speaker, uh, Stephen. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to address something that Sema had written, and that is uh, something that's very relevant, and that is, uh, as, you know, as long as you have capitalism, you will have a war. And that's definitely been uh, our experience uh, in the 20th and 21st century. Uh, and certainly Canada as an imperialist nation, uh, nation is involved um, in, in battles that are happening uh, right across the globe in the Middle East, in Haiti, in Honduras, uh, Afghanistan, Syria, you name it, uh, troops in uh, parts of Africa. Um, imperialism is a reality, is a reality of modern capitalism. And I think if we, when we read uh, Luxembourg's works about earliest, early 20th century uh, German capitalism or French capitalism or British capitalism, she knew that despite the, the boom in the latter half of the 19th century, that eventually the system would move into crisis, that eventually the system would generate war, eventually the system uh, would take on an imperialist character. So I think we learned that from Rosa. She understood uh, and she brought everything back to basics, Marxist basics about crisis and war. Um, so I, I just wanted to to mention that I think Barry's point is important. Um, reformism is a very different animal uh, in 2020 than it was certainly in 1919, but it's still reformism, and it's very much reformism without reforms. So we we need to engage in that battle, and certainly we read Rosa with reformism in mind. Uh, spontaneity, um, it's a reality that revolutions are, uh, by their very nature, spontaneous. The revolutions in uh, this, the Arab Spring revolutions in the Middle East were spontaneous uh, revolutions. The February revolution in Russia was a spontaneous revolution. So we know that the same way that crisis and war are products of the capitalist system, that revolution is also a feature of, of, of capitalism. And we know that it's not a question of if, but when revolutions happen and when they happen, can they be led in such a way um, that we can ultimately deal uh, decisively with a system that keeps everybody down. Um, just a couple of other points I wanted to raise um, before leaving, and that is uh, 1919 is an exciting um, date in history certainly revolution in Europe, revolution uh, certainly in Germany and in Hungary in 1919 and Bavaria in 1919. Uh, as well, uh, we had revolts uh, throughout North America. We had the Winnipeg general strike in 1919. Uh, we had uh, general strikes in places like Seattle and in Toronto and in places as small as Amherst, Nova Scotia, there was the Amherst General Strike of 1919. So that was a year where the system was in peril. The capitalist system uh, was at its weakest. And it, it certainly um, tells us what the potential was for revolutionary change 
1919. Even reading about uh, the revolutionary wave in, in, in England at the time in 1919, uh, certainly it would have been a different outcome had uh, the workers' movement known the potential power that they had in their hands. One last point is this, to the extent that we think we know Rosa Luxemburg, up until a few years ago, only 25% of her writings were available in English. So um, a few years ago, um, uh, a socialist by the name of Peter uh, Hudis uh, had started to um, get more of her work available in English. So um, I want to encourage uh, folks watching to check out um, his, um, his uh, new series on um, her works. And uh, perhaps when the other 75% of her work is available in English, um, we can have a better appreciation of what she actually stood for. Okay, thank you, Stephen. A special thanks to Stephen, Dahlia, John, and to our producer, Kurt Young and Mrs. Saga, and to everyone who participated in tonight's conversation. Please consider buying a subscription to Socialist Action Newspaper. It's only $25 for one year and it's delivered to your door. To fill out the form, just visit our website at www.socialistaction.ca. That's www.socialistaction.ca. And if you would just like to talk to us about joining us, say, write to Socialist Action Canada at gmail.com or just give us a buzz at 647-986-1917. That's 647-986-1917. Once again, folks, if you like this show, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. The next Socialist Action webcast is on Thursday, October the 29th at 7 p.m. and is titled How to Build a Revolutionary Party Today with Henry Heller, Professor of History at the University of Manitoba, Gary Porter, Socialist Action Organizer in British Columbia, and Suzanne Weiss, author of Holocaust to Resistance in Toronto. For the details, just visit www.socialistaction.ca. In the meantime, please stay safe, stay healthy, and be active. Bye for now.